You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy. One of the questions that we've been seeing circling around the different social media groups that we participate in, even some of the conversations that we've had with colleagues and each other, is when do we go back to the office and see clients? Now, this conversation is going to be largely dependent on the orders that are going on in your local jurisdiction. So one of the through lines of this episode is that is one of the considerations to follow is what your local jurisdiction's orders are. But there seems to be a lot of layers to this, especially when it comes to the type of work that we do, that when we consider not only the safety measures around physical distancing, but also the relational issues that come up. And we'll get into some of the resources that are guiding these public decisions or these recommendations, the WHO, the CDC, some of the government recommendations that are out there. And we'll include links to a bunch of stuff in our show notes. You can find those at mtsgpodcast.com. But there's not only those physical and you know virus sort of recommendations, there's a lot of clinical considerations that we have to look at here as well. But Katie, as we're sitting here recording this at the very end of April, when do you think that you're going back into the office? I honestly don't have any idea. I know that in California, there is some discussion that will start reopening in a couple of weeks. I think that there are a lot of different things to consider, even if we're starting phase one or two or three of returning back to people moving freely around the country. And for me, I, I've i had a lot of clients that were on telehealth prior to this. So I think that there's a comfort and a security in knowing that I can remain at least partially telehealth. But when I start thinking about going into the office, there's several things I'm looking at. And I think one of them, and I think this is one that maybe therapists should start with is their own safety and comfort and financial needs. Because I think each therapist is going to have their own individual factors. And I've talked about several times that I've got asthma and autoimmune concerns. And so for me, I may go back later than other folks. Uh, Some people have ailing family members. And so I think it's something where Listen to what your local jurisdiction says, but also really pay attention to your own needs because I think that there are potentially going to be factors to either push you to stay home or push you to go back to the office. And I think, you know, as I like to say, always make your own decision based on critical thinking, identify what you want to do and how it's going to support you and your family. Because I think that's, you know, kind of my preface is this is going to be individual to each clinician as well. I think I'm with you when it comes to when I'm going to return to the office. My gut feeling right now, California is very much in phase one. We're at least a couple of weeks out from potentially moving into phase two. And if you haven't familiarized yourself with what those different phases are, phase one is the stay-at-home orders. It's the physical and work from home pretty much everybody, unless you are an essential worker, and even for many of us, our essential work that can be done from home should be done from home. Making personal protective equipment, PPE, available to workers who do have to go out there. Now, phase two is the, at least the California definition of this, is the slow reopening of lower risk workplaces. Maybe retail stores, manufacturing, offices when telework isn't available and reopening some of the public spaces. Now, the recommendations from the California government on this is for individuals to still practice physical distancing, stay six feet apart, to have face coverings, to avoid non-essential travel, and to support and care for people who are high risk. Now, some of you are going to be working in 
individual practices where you're the only one who's there. Some of you might be working in uh, larger group settings or agencies, or you might be employers yourselves. And the recommendations is from California is still to have employees continue to work from home when possible, even in phase two, and to implement some adaptations. And we'll get into the CDC and who recommendations on this uh, here in a little bit. But also making sure that there is appropriate wage replacement so sick workers can stay home when they're sick. So even moving into this phase two, to me, at least in my practice, looks a lot like phase one, which is being at home, still continuing to do telehealth for a lot of clients because I mean, my offices are appropriately sized, but some offices that I've seen of other therapists, you can't be six feet apart from your clients yeah. and putting face masks on even within that space just kind of cuts into some of the clinical material that we would be seeing being expressed. Sure. And I think the other thing that you're talking about is phase two is really low risk work environments. And if we look at some group practices, practices that primarily work with kids and families, if we have practices that have a lot of small office spaces, that kind of stuff, I argue that they may be more of a phase three workplace where there is going to be a lot of interaction. And so I think each clinician needs to assess their practice by how low risk it actually is. Like you said, I'm a solo practitioner. I have one other office mate, sweet mate, and he is a solo practitioner. We probably could work it out so that we have clients on different days. And there's, I can see it being pretty low risk. Group practices where people are sharing offices like hour by oh, hour. Yeah. I mean, like that stuff just can't happen. That's a phase three, right? Well, both of my office suites, I have at least five other people who work in the various offices in the suites. The waiting rooms are constantly busy. I mean, the waiting rooms are another place of yeah. trying yeah. to keep people spaced apart. But this is going to be a coordination of a lot of schedules. One of the CDC's recommendations is to have staggered work schedules to minimize the interactions between even workers. Now, for every worker who's there, you've also got at least one client, if not yeah. a parent who's bringing in a kid or a spouse or something else that starts to congregate people. This might still be you know, well under 20 people overall there on a normal day. But the interactions between all of these people is what we're really looking at trying to minimize. Now, this is really something where looking at these CDC recommendations is hopefully going to help guide some of your decisions around this. But one of the first things that I'm going to look at is the CDC's guidelines on reopening workplaces during the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of their first questions is, will reopening be in compliance with your state and local orders? As the law and ethics person on the show, <laughs> follow That's the law. The law. <laughs> it's the law. But uh, in addition to that, that... It, are you working in a community that no longer requires significant mitigation? Are you able to protect employees that have a higher risk for severe illness if employment is part of the decision here? Now, if the answer to those three questions is yes, CDC is now saying, okay, at the next level of this, this isn't like a go ahead and open yet, but the next things to consider is how intensely are you willing to clean? Because you should be intensely cleaning. Yeah. And you should be disinfecting and ventilating and not letting the air just kind of sit there and hang out. Mm -hmm. Promoting healthy hygiene, wash your hands a lot, wear a face covering, and ensure that social distancing is installed. And one of their recommendations is to put up barriers to ensure that you are remaining or your clients are remaining six feet away from each other. Yeah. And I've never been to a therapy office that has those plexiglass like sneeze guards like over the salad bar. But if that's the direction that we're looking at going, telehealth seems to still be a good option right now. 
Sure. I, I think the mask or a plexiglass screen or whatever, I think does hinder the in-person experience. I think that each clinician is going to need to find his or her or their own perspective on this, because I think that some people are very much impacted by the energy of the room. Some people are going to be taking in more information, even if someone's wearing a mask because of you know how their body is positioned, how they are dressed, what's going on. I think there's arguments to the flip side, which is if on a telehealth, you can see how they're living space looks, you can, you know, you're going to get more facial expression, you potentially actually are closer to their face than you normally are. So I think that the clinical impacts of that, I think, are something that are really relevant in deciding around that. Because I think, yeah, I imagine with some of my clients where we've become very comfortable with telehealth, going into the office might feel novel, it might actually feel better energetically, but I'm going to lose clinical information if we're both wearing masks. This comes to even at this point in your decision making, and Katie, you as a systems person should appreciate this, is starting to come up with what your guidelines to your clients are going to mm -hmm. be for that eventual return. Because you need to, A, communicate to your clients what's going to be expected. If masks are going to be expected, let your clients know that and be prepared to enforce that when they show up without a mask. Yeah. Yeah. And then I dive into that, the clinical work of why they're refusing to follow your office. <laughs> sure. Sure. And I, and I want to reiterate something about communication because I think we should have an opportunity, unlike telehealth that we had to jump into very quickly, going back to the office, I think we can be more thoughtful and have discussions around. And so Although on a group practice level, maybe you want to have, as a group practice owner, you want to send out a, a mass email to talk about general office policies once people come into the office, that kind of stuff. On an individual clinician level, I really recommend having individualized conversations, potentially in session, to be able to make a decision together based on the factors in that specific therapeutic relationship. Because I think a lot of folks, initially, you get so overwhelmed and you want to, you know, kind of follow these, these like, I got to tell everybody everything. And it's like, well, there are some clients who aren't going to go back to the office, so they don't necessarily need to know the guidelines. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's also some clients who will need you to, ha to have you talk through those guidelines anyway, because they'll want to understand them and, and have a buy-in. And so to me, I think the biggest piece is be prepared and plan your conversations with each of your clients pretty carefully. And a lot of you probably are getting a sense of some of these conversations need to be tailored really specifically to some clients. I can imagine that there's a lot of clients on my caseload where they, they would respond just fine to a generalized email that's sent out to everybody. Sure. But, I'm hearing from a lot of clinicians about clients that are nervous about the outside world right now and potentially moving into some anxieties that just don't want them to interact that's maybe leading down that, that path of agoraphobia that sure. are going to really need a lot more structured conversation for them on that individual level rather than just kind of a here's all of these things that I'm putting into place that make the outside world still seem scary compared to what you had <laughs> hoped it would be. Sure. And I think that that being able to identify the clinical elements of this are really important and what's yours and what's your client's. Because I think there are a lot of folks that are going to have their own worries and their own reactions to leaving their homes, to going back into their offices, to taking on potentially fairly onerous practices in order to keep everyone safe. And so really identifying what's your stuff and then what's the clinical content and material with your client. Because, you know, I think about a couple of my clients that I think are, are really heading, you know, they're straight heading straight towards agoraphobia. And that's going to be completely separate, that conversation from the policies and procedures. I think those policies and procedures, when they're ready to consider coming back to the office, will be very reassuring and will be part of the discussion and how, how, how well am I keeping people in compliance and what am I seeing and what, the, you know, those things could be very comforting. But I certainly, that's not the first conversation when I'm just barely beginning to open. Those folks are staying telehealth for a little while. It may even help 
open up some of these conversations now as far as what some of your considerations are. I know, and again, this episode is being recorded in late April, but I'm having families start questioning, what about when our kids go to school in August, September, as as far as things like scheduling and getting into the office? And I'm like, oh, hold on. Like, this last month took 10 years, and that's four <laughs> months away from now. <laughs> That what my plan is, is to fill in the blank during the meantime, and we'll continue to have this conversation about reopening. But my considerations for right now is that we'll continue into a telehealth platform. Now, some of you listening, and I've seen a couple of these questions are operating in areas that are reopening, at least on the governmental level, starting to move into phase two and are raising the question about telehealth reimbursement. That a lot of people, as I understand it, got kind of ushered into, hey, telehealth just being reimbursed by the insurance companies, but there's a question of how that's going to continue to play out. And I'm going to turn this point over to you because you are paneled, and mm -hmm. this is not something that I know a lot of the logistics about. So what's what are you getting a sense of with insurance companies and the potential of them rolling back some of these telehealth requirements or easements that they've made? My sense is that there are going to be pitfalls and traps uh, once the crisis is deemed over and what, whatever that means, because I think that there are a lot of folks that popped on to telehealth and started billing either in network or out of network and insurance companies are just reimbursing it right now. And so a lot of folks, and I, and this is something, and we, we kind of talked about this in the, the episode on confidential communications, a lot of folks were kind of saying, well, I just have to take care of it. And they did it really quickly. And they did it to the minimum standards that are currently needed. You know, I'm just going to use Skype, or I'm just going to whatever, right? Like, they're not necessarily doing the HIPAA compliance stuff, or they're not necessarily doing what I think they should do with insurance, which is to make sure that if you're paneled, that you've also done whatever is required. For me, it was like an attestation. It was a little form. It was a back and forth. It was really painless, especially right now, because a lot of insurance panels are actually giving the information out versus you having to search on a website to figure out how to do it. But for, bo for both of the panels that I'm primarily billing to, I did attestation forms. And basically, I got back, here's how you bill telehealth. And so I can bill telehealth, assuming that it's in a client's plan, ongoing. Now, for Cigna, which is one of the plans out here, they actually have said that they, it's a policy that they've publicly put out that they will cover telehealth. And this was before COVID, that they will publicly, they've pu publicly put out that they will cover telehealth for all clients at the same rate as in person. And so other plans, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know how many are going to pull back. I think there's arguments around Medicare and Medicaid and whether or not they'll continue to, to cover telehealth. This is a little bit more nuanced than I have personal knowledge of. So I think it's really important if insurance is a primary portion of your practice and you want to continue to see people on telehealth, I would really reach out to those provider services, provider relationships, provider relations people and see what you can do and if they have a sense on whether plans will universally cover telehealth or if there's going to be some fancy footwork you're going to have to do when the crisis is considered officially over. My hope, and I know this is a super naive hope, is that insurance plans will be slow to, to move off of, hey, we're just going to cover, cover telehealth. But I think it is a consideration and I think that there can be arguments and advocacy that we should not be required to go back into offices to be able to bill for services. But that was some of the beginning issues when people were moving out of offices to telehealth is that they felt like they had to keep meeting with people in person because of insurance requirements or Medicaid or Medicare requirements. It is an issue. And I'm glad that you bring up that advocacy piece. I'm certain I know of at least one of the professional organizations that is working with the insurance 
piece of this a little bit. That's the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Katie and I are board members. We're not speaking for them, but we at least know that they're having some of these conversations right now to help guide the membership as far as what potentially is coming next and what those steps might be. I'm hoping that the other professional organizations are following suit. Sure. Now, worst case comes to worst, what I'm taking out of what you're saying, though, is take those steps now before the orders really start coming in. And then you're left back into another scramble of, am I now having to go into the office and see clients who are reluctant to come into the office because now there's that financial piece of, well, if I'm not getting paid, do I have to choose between money and getting sick? So... And I think the other piece, too, is that it also doesn't honor what the client's needs are. I think that there are folks on Medicaid, Medicare, who are at higher risk. And so forcing them to come into a workplace and not be able to get telehealth is also problematic. So I think it's it's something where if you're able to, on all most of your insurance plans, get some coverage there, it gives you more of an ability to take care of your clients as well. I want to move into the logistics of it because I think that there we've said a lot about, okay, there's considerations, maybe you should go into the office, maybe not, that kind of stuff. But assuming that you're going to go into the office, one of the things that I saw in some unrelated blog, and I'll find it, I think it was uh, some business blog that said, one of the ways that you protect is to shorten the work week. So the fewer days you're in the office the fewer days that the office is used, any of that stuff, the the better it can be. And so one of the things I've been considering is doing like, I'm going to have my day at the office and then the rest will be telehealth. And I know with group practice owners or people that share office spaces, it could be that you stagger. And I know you talked about kind of staggering shifts earlier, Kurt. But I think it means having conversations both with your clients as well as with any colleagues that you share office space with or supervisees or whatever, that you really get the scheduling down and make it as tight as possible so that you're not having so much overlap that it's impossible. Because I do think that there are going to be a lot of hybrid practices for a long time. And so that means that office spaces can be used a little bit further apart. You know, I guess there's some people that were like, they were so busy that people were like, you know, chasing each other out of the rooms and stuff. So I mean, we may not be super far away where people can have hours in between to have anything (laughs) and cleaning and that kind of stuff. But if you're able to limit the time in the office, as well as limit the number of people in the office, I think that's a good first step. I'm also looking at the World Health Organization's recommendations on ways of preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. And their recommendations are not only to be clean and hygienic on all of the surfaces that you should be wiping down and disinfecting regularly, but removing a lot of the items that don't need to be there, especially items with kind of the porous surfaces that uh, can maybe hold on to things a little bit longer. You saw a recommendation about changing doorknobs to make it to where (laughs) it's something where it's handicap accessible. You know, who would have thought that, This would be what pushes us to make our offices more handicap accessible. But these are the kinds of recommendations that are out there right now. And, you know, there's a lot of considerations. If you are in one of those group practices, the owners of the practices should be training you on how to be clean in the office and having office protocols to follow about hand washing. I'm seeing some stuff about the respiratory hygiene. I've seen kind of some mixed information on the effectiveness of air filters in the office on one hand. Like HEPA filters? Like HEPA filters, exactly. On one hand, that the HEPA filters should theoretically filter out things as small as a virus and even smaller. But I've also seen conflicting information that says they would also need to have these air purifiers in between you and the person who's coughing or sneezing in order to catch that. Otherwise it's still floating in space. So it doesn't seem like it would hurt, but it's also not a first line defense. 
Sure. And I think the things that we were talking about, I think we put it in the viral episode, you know, wiping down services with, with, you know, kind of the, what are those called? Disinfecting wipes. <laughs> Disinfecting wipes, uh, using hand sanitizer, having san- hand sanitizer available for clients, you know, wearing a mask, requiring your clients to wear a mask. Some folks are doing uh, the temperature thing so that you can, you know, make sure that nobody comes in with a fever I think the other thing, and we did talk about this in the previous episode as well, is having a policy for both clients and any clinicians in your practice to not come to the office with any kind of illness symptoms. I think I'm going to guess, Kurt, that you would still recommend potentially waiving, you know, late cancel fees in this regard so that people are not coming to the office sick to to avoid that or Definitely. really recommending telehealth if there's an even allergy symptoms. I think it it's something where there becomes that clinical issue. And I think you started talking about this earlier with the mask, but if somebody comes in and has a sniffle, if somebody comes in and has a fever, if somebody comes in and isn't wearing a mask, I mean that's a convert that's potentially a hard boundary for a therapist to to set, especially if you've got clients who've not had telehealth, who don't have access to the technology, who are in crisis emotionally. And like this could be pretty tough for some of some of our colleagues. Well, and as I'm thinking about it, if we're putting out there hand sanitizer available for clients and that kind of stuff is a good, healthy practice of our practice. Once masks do become more widely available, it might be a good opportunity for you to have some disposable masks on your in your office just for clients in those particular situations. Sure. If those are the recommendations that are still necessary. Now, I do know of a couple of practices where they're taking clients' temperatures as they're entering in and out of Talk about a, a whole wealth of, you know, where that relationship ends up shifting the <laughs> clinical discussions. I know that there's plenty of businesses who do. And at the time of this recording, we have reached out to a colleague who's a lawyer and asked, you know, therapists, can we legally take our clients' temperatures? Is this kind of shifting us outside of our scope of competence? And our lawyer friend said, I'm sure that you can do it but maybe talk with somebody a little bit more in depth and somebody that you're paying to actually <laughs> answer this question. So our, our we tried to get free advice. We got free advice. <laughs> and we will we are sharing the exact level of that free advice out there to you as we we do when we do share kind of where these legal discussions are, but it was just something that our friend didn't have the readily available information at the time. So talk with a lawyer if that's something that you're considering doing and make sure that you do so appropriately. And I think that there's other things that that some folks have have asked. For example, if you don't have a temperature thing, I don't it's like a fancy one where you like a, a fancy thermometer, a, a temperature, a thing. fancy thermometer that you point at there. I'm like making gestures to Kurt to try, like the one that, that like the they gesture point that at she's your making looks like she's shooting herself in the head. I know, but it's like people pointed at the, the anyway. But like, if you don't want to invest in that, or you don't feel comfortable being a person that's taking the temperature of your client as they come in, and for some larger group practices, I'm assuming front desk staff can do that for both clinicians and clients if, if you feel like that's a step to take. And again, I appreciate Kurt saying like, talk to your own legal advice and probably pay for it. But some people are asking their clients, it's kind of a an honor system, like take your temperature before you come. And if you have a fever, please don't come. You know, so I think that there's, there's also things where it's like, we're in this together. Let's report symptoms. Let's take our temperatures. Let's make sure that we're not arriving to an office compromised. Uh, There's some interesting other recommendations in here from the World Health Organization about considerations before having meetings with other people. And their very first consideration is consider whether a face-to-face meeting is even needed. And this comes back to the, if you can continue to do telehealth, maybe you should probably should. Making sure that you structure to where people can physically distance, asking people in advance if they have any symptoms or feel unwell, don't attend. 
uh, limiting the amount of physical contact, even of items within sessions. So this comes to if you don't have contactless payment methods for the end of your sessions, right now is a good time to get those kinds of things set up in your practice. Absolutely. One of the really interesting things in here that stands out to me, though, is keeping a list of all of the people who enter into your workspace. Now, Ooh. This <laughs> is one of those areas of potential breaking confidentiality that is carved into the law in many jurisdictions. And this is so that public health officials, when they're trying to trace the chain of infection, do actually have access to being able to ask you, hey, who in here, you know, we, we know that this client was sick. They told us that they came into your office. Who else came here that we need to potentially warn? That is an area of confidentiality that you might be mandated to break. That might be a gentle reminder for you that when we are obligated to occasionally remind our clients of where the limits of confidentiality fall. This is not one that we get tested on a whole lot in our licensing tests or we discuss yeah. a whole lot, but making sure that that is a pertinent part of some of the conversations that you have when considering bringing your clients back into the office. And it, it's something where, especially if you're putting in some new policies around coming into the office you're potentially adding a telehealth release form or consent form. If you're adding a telehealth consent form, if you're shifting some of your practices, it may make sense at this time to update your office policies and consent for treatment so that you can add that as a potential reason that you would have to break confidentiality. I think it's, it's something where I would be surprised as a client if all of a sudden I'm finding out that somebody else <laughs> went to my therapist's office, had COVID, and I'm being contacted saying, well, you went to your therapist's office and another client had COVID. I'll be like, um, what? <laughs> so I think it's important to have that conversation. And it may be a consideration for some people, especially those with huge privacy needs, that they don't want to come back to the office until they feel comfortable that they're not going to have their privacy breached. And I think that I just want to do one more comment about, because we're almost out of time, but one more comment about the considerations for coming back into the office. I know that there are a lot of folks who have been very heartbroken by some of their clients, families, you know, those kinds of things who have not been able to be served well by telehealth. And I really want to support all of you in bringing them back into a more effective therapy space, effectively technology, lack of privacy, being in unsafe environments. We know that there's been so many folks who have been really struggling with telehealth and maybe ready to jump into back into the office work really quickly. And I'm sure you're going to be thoughtful about it. And I know I've had, I don't know how many sessions I've had with people in their cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a lot, you know? And so I think it's something where being able to really be strategic about this so that you can get back to the business of taking care of those clients, I think is going to be so critical because if we get sick, if our clients get sick, it's just heartbreaking. So I, I know that there's stuff we can't prevent, but I think really looking at the CDC and WHO guidelines can be very helpful to, to provide some consideration for those clients that you know need to be back in the office. Katie and I have our personal choices. I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that I'm leaning towards staying telehealth for a while. I'm going to direct my employees to hang on to telehealth for as long as possible. I think it's also reasonable to expect that you may reopen and then be forced to move right back into telehealth if the case numbers and directives end up becoming more restrictive again. And we know that a lot of us are doing our best and trying to be sensitive to those clients that Katie is referring to here that potentially desperately do need in-person services. But I think that now that the dust has 
mostly settled as far as the transition over to stay-at-home orders for most of us, that we can start to cautiously look ahead at those considerations to coming forward. And we really encourage you to take this time to start putting these things into place so that way it's not as much of a shock to you or your clients, your practice, and making sure that you do go into it mindfully with the best intent in mind and the best practices in mind that continue to keep everyone safe and healthy. And I think it can be hard to make these decisions in isolation. Uh, Big thank you to James Gay, who brought this conversation into the Modern Therapist group on Facebook, where we were able to kind of talk through some of these things, as well as just kind of the nervousness around it. And so we would definitely invite you, if you're not already in the group, come join us over at the Modern Therapist group on Facebook. And check out our show notes at mtsgpodcast.com. And while you're over there, check out what we're doing with the Therapy Reimagined Conference. We've got some updates that are coming here that we're just trying to figure out how we can continue to best put on a show. And for the best updates on that, check out the website as well. And until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Renoy. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 